we'll start the, the, the last session in this morning. And it's my big pleasure to welcome Professor Yanni Erola. He's Professor of Sociology at the Department of Social Research at the University of Turku and Director of the INVEST Research Flag, Flagship Center. Uh, he'll talk to us today about uh, a very relevant uh, topic, which is how should we expect the welfare state to influence the, equal the equality of opportunity? So the floor is yours, Yanni. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Um, yes, I tried to share my presentation, which is here. Okay, everybody sees this, I hope. Yeah, so uh, thank you for inviting me to talk here. And this is uh, partially related to, the, to the, the research I'm conducting myself at the moment, but also more broadly related to the, the flagship center, what, we're, what we have and what we do. And we are interested in basically all kinds of uh, processes that are related to uh, uh, welfare state and its connection, how that influences ki kids, uh, uh, children, uh, uh, youth and uh, young adults and young families as well. So this is of course highly relevant for all of these discussions, the, the whole topic. So, but anyway, uh, this is uh, also based on a joint uh, and ongoing research I have, I'm, I'm doing currently with uh, Tina Bayer at the University of Oslo and Handu Lehti here at the University of Turku. Uh, but uh, like I said, that this is much uh, working progress. So uh, let's say, uh, and that so that the results I show will be rather, rather preliminary in, in various sense. So anyway, the background of this presentation is that the, 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 that the, uh, we know that the egalitarian welfare state have less inequality of outcomes, uh, be that, for instance, persistence of poverty, income differences, uh, even gender differences in the labor market and so forth. And how we usually assume that the that the countries uh, that these countries also have a higher level of equality of opportunity uh, in terms of a high amount of intergenerational social mobility and a lower importance of family background when it comes to socioeconomic attainment, be that uh, education, occupational status, or income, and yeah, or any other socioeconomic outcome in, in question. Uh, but however, if you look at the actual research looking at this, how, how much better these countries are, uh, egalitarian, egalitarian welfare states are doing in terms of uh, equality of opportunity, uh, the empirical evidence seems to be a bit patchy. I mean, we can start from the seminal uh, comparative work of Ericsson Goldthorp almost 30 years ago, where they already show that there's a weak indications that uh, these egalitarian social democratic welfare states actually would have a higher level uh, of social mobility. And this basically the same result is repeated a number of times after that. Uh, basically all of this saying the same that, okay, that seems to be that on average, the, the, the social mobility is relatively high and the family background matters relatively little, but, but not that much different to the other types of the welfare state. So maybe this is not that quite the we cannot really quite too strongly come make this conclusion that the, that the welfare state, uh, egalitarian welfare state would drive the equality of opportunity. Now, the question is then, why is this? You would assume that, okay, if, if it influences this uh, uh, welfare state influence any other inequalities, why they would not show in the equality of opportunity then? And uh, one of the, potential reasons is that this is simply that the equality opportunity does not actually necessarily lead to higher social mobility. Uh, we usually understand equality of opportunity as a so-called fair equal opportunity, uh, uh, meaning that the equally skilled and motivated uh, should have the same opportunities to achieve positions in societies independently what, uh, on what kind of a family they are born into. Uh, but if we follow this uh, principle closely, uh, uh, and uh, if the social differences are uh, followed from the genetically inherited skills, uh, the, the low amount of social mobility could be easily justified by the, according to these principles of this fair equal opportunity. So actually, fair equal opportunity would be fine with having, uh, having actually lo uh, uh, having low uh, social mobility. Uh, and then, the, of course, the alternative uh, uh, 
explanation for might be that the actually it might be that the egalitarian welfare states actually make the the effect of family background stronger, at least as, as much as it's related to the genetic inheritance. And there is some literature is kind of uh, assuming this and also um, uh, based on this assumption that the, the heritability measures uh, realization of genetic potential. So basically the uh, heritability here missing the proportion of the variance in an outcome attributed to genetic influences. And the, the argument goes basically that, okay, the, the social environments restrict the realization of the genetic potential each individual has to different extents. And by doing that, these environments also limit the equality of opportunity to different extents. Uh, so a society that gets rid of these barriers will also see an increasing importance of, of genes in attainment. And if the welfare, the egalitarian welfare states are really effective in reducing these barriers, perhaps it then leads to the stronger role of uh, genetic influences in attainment, uh, which then should transmit as a greater uh, overall family background effect in, in attainment as well. Uh, but then again, when we are looking at the empirical studies on this topic, uh, the evidence is a bit patchy again. There is a recent paper by Engsel and Trop where they show that the increasing social mobility seems to be associated with stronger influence of, of these genes in educational attainment. However, there's an other paper that actually shows that when we compare societies together, um, heritability of uh, education is actually at the same level in both egalitarian welfare status in, in other societies. So it doesn't really support this assumption either as such. So the question is then what has been missed in these previous studies? What is kind of a missing element that is kind of a, is, is not in the, in, included in this story. Um, so our assumption is uh, that, the, that, the, that actually the egalitarian welfare states do not follow this much of this fair equal opportunities principle, but, but rather the the leveling of the playing field or the lack egalitarian version of equality of opportunity. And the difference in this version of equality of opportunity is that it aims at reducing all societal relevant differences that uh, follow from the lack of birth, especially during the childhood and youth. And these, of course, these socially relevant differences can be related to the family environment, but they also include kind of the the different innate abilities that uh, children might have uh, in terms of the differences to biological inheritance as well. And when we think about the different kind of institutions, this is what they do. Uh, we have nurseries, early childcare system, family financial support and so forth. All of these actually trying to level the playing field in terms of our, from the kid's point of view at least. Now, at the same time, we are also uh, following the argument that Esping Andersen has been done in uh, in, in, in some of these, his recent papers or, uh, or the uh, late uh, recent papers about this topic, namely that the egalitarian welfare state does not really concern that about uh, what happens to the rich or what makes people rich, but rather what happens, what explains that people become poor. So the policies are mainly aimed at reducing inequalities at the top, uh, at the bottom of the strata, and this substantially change little at the top. So basically, uh, Rich can get as rich as they want, basically. Um, and the, the association between the equality of opportunity and the welfare state depends then on the combination of the policies and the characteristics of outcomes. And this, of course, may, may, may look very different depending on the outcome in the end. So, so uh, like I will show in a shortly, it's a pretty straightforward mechanism in the case of income, for instance, but it's much more clear, uh, complex for education. So uh, if you think about what welfare st state does to the income, it's kind of a summarized in this picture. So this is just plotting the income deciles in Finland from 2019, uh, according to their uh, net, in uh, net uh, in equalized income in each of these groups. And these lines just show the, the income level before the uh, income transfers and after the transfers. You can see what happens that basically welfare state takes to taxation, money from the rich and uh, distribute to the poor more or less. And what happens is that, uh, that the relative differences at the bottom are reduced considerably until the, let's say to the fifth quintile. 
Uh, and this also means that most likely that the importance of any differences to the family background are considerably reduced at the, in the bottom of the distribution. Um, and if we look at the top end of the distribution, even the, that the absolute effect is actually bigger uh, in there, the relative advantages at the top are likely to remain. So they are still doing much better than the rest of the population in terms of income, despite the redistribution. Um, and this most likely means that the same applies to the multiplicative advantages related to the family background there, that, that the relative advantages of having high social status parents will remain at the top, of, top end of the income distribution. Uh, the things are a bit more complex when we look at the when we look at the um, uh, welfare welfare state and education. So what the egalitarian welfare state simply does to do uh, to tries to do in terms of education is that it tries to make more children to move more uh, to the next level of education. So uh, it provides universal financial support for families and kids themselves in studies. There's no tuition fees at any levels of education. This is kind of a the one of the key characteristics of the egalitarian welfare state they're, they're everywhere um, there's targeted aid for special needs group this can be also provided in other types of welfare state but it's i think this is something that is kind of a hard written in the legislation in these countries especially and then there's of course a part of the expansion of the higher uh, expansion of the higher education taking place but of course this is something that happens everywhere not only uh, in the egalitarian welfare state that much now, what follows is that from this, that, that actually the welfare state changes the distribution of the education. And, and this is of course have a specific uh, consequences for intergenerational attainment. Uh, first of all, uh, the financial and at least some of the social barriers to further education are effectively removed. And the question is what then happens? Uh, it might then be that actually the, what some of the literature expects that, the, that, the in, that increases the importance of genes at some part of the distribution. Uh, we expect that the higher education, achieving higher education is more or less the same as in the achieving top income. There doesn't seem to be much to hinder the multiplicative advantage among the advantage there. So that basically the, the highest social status parents can still help their kids to do better in education, even if there are more people coming there from the other backgrounds as well. Um, and also, the, 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 it seems to be that the compulsory educated, that the low, those who stay at the lower educational level, that should become smaller and smaller in group, but also at the same time, it should be increasingly negatively selected group. And this, of course, have consequences on the on the on on the intergenerational attainment as well so it's smaller but perhaps the the problems uh, that are keeping people there at the at the low level of education are uh, perhaps harder to solve so we are looking at this uh, using the registered data from finland uh, we're looking at the finnish twins born 75 to 86 we have four outcomes in in this presentation uh, not acquiring a secondary education degree by the age of 28, acquiring a master's level degree by the same age, being in lowest income decile or the highest income decile. So these are some four different outcomes, basically. And we look at these outcomes uh, uh, also according to parental status. And we have this composite index and we present the results by the, uh, by the basically highest and lowest SES quintile uh, of the parents. Uh, what we do in our analysis, we do uh, apply classical twin design, a bit modified version of that though. So the, according to the, the, the method, the, the dizygotic twins share about 50% of the DNA and the monozygotic uh, twins have, are genetically identical. And the, we can use this information to decompose variants of in any outcome into variance components, which are the additive genetic influences and the shared environmental influences and the non-shared environmental influences. And, and the family background effect that we are interested in, they should show in either A or C components here. Now, our data does not include information on the zygosity, so we use gender to approximate it. And this is based on the uh, knowledge that the half of the same-sex twins are identical. So we adjust the components accordingly so that we can get extract the A and credible A, C and A components. 
Uh, what is important to note here that we did not find any st statistically significant C component in any of the analysis. So the results that I'm going to show are from the more simple uh, e AE models only. And this also means that the family background effects that we have must be mainly related to the <clears throat> additive genetic influences and their potential interaction with the parental status um, because of the way we measure that. Uh, so the first the results for the income. Uh, on the left side, we have uh, uh, the uh, in results for the lowest income decile or, or that whether the, uh, whether the uh, twin is in the lowest in income decile. And we can see immediately that the, the variance due to genetic influences is very low. So, and it doesn't vary by family background. And this just overall, when we don't have C component either, this suggests that in general, family background matters very little for being in the lowest income decile. This was what we were expecting that the welfare state does. It basically removes most of the differences and variation related to family background here. Uh, what we can see in the opposite end of the income distribution, the, when we're looking at the probability of being in the highest income decile, the pattern is very different. We see that the, among the kids who come from the uh, low parental STS group, the, the genetic component is very small. It doesn't really seem to be helping them that, they, uh, that, that much. But when we look at the, to the opposite end of the distribution, the kids of the higher socioeconomic background uh, families, there we have a substantial uh, A component or genetic component. So it seems to be that there are multiplicative advantages among those kids, also in terms of what they can achieve to the, the genetic influences. Uh, so that again saying that what we expected that the welfare state doesn't really interfere in the, uh, at the top end of the income distribution that much. Now, when we look at the education, the situation is very similar. When we look at the top end of the distribution, the master's degree, we have the almost exactly the same pattern that we observe for the top income. Uh, there's very much coming for the, for the, from, the, uh, from the genetic uh, part influences for among the low educated, uh, sorry, low, uh, low parental says family kids but there's much more advantages coming from the, uh, from the parents if the parents are in the, uh, are in the uh, high parental SCS group. And quite interesting, we have the exactly opposite uh, pattern for the low education. So here we actually observe the, the higher genetic component among the low uh, parental SCS group and nearly nothing among the, the high SCS group. And this most likely is related to the negative selection that's taking place in, the, in this group. A bit more in the, in this, about this in the conclusions where I get now. So the results for the shared environment kind of indicates that, yeah, the egalitarian welfare state can effectively reduce uh, this part of the family background effect. Um, the results for the low income also so that sometimes egalitarian welfare state can also reduce effectively genetic influences. And this is sometimes forgotten in this uh, literature. So this is, uh, this is also, it depends a bit on the outcome and what, what uh, society does. Um, also excluding taxation, the egalitarian welfare state does little to restrict the accumulation of advantage among the, the children of the high SES parents. Uh, in our results, it shows us a stronger genetic influences among the children of the highest as parents in the case of the top income and higher education. And uh, third, most likely due to socially stratified negative selection to low education, we observe the opposite pattern for not acquiring at least a secondary education degree. So uh, the genetic influences are strongest for the children of the lowest CS parents. And what this suggested is that the, actually the mechanism, mechanism that uh, the matter for genetic influences are different for different educational outcomes, but we cannot really say based on this analysis only how they are different. Are they entirely different aspects of uh, what we inherit that matter for these two, two groups? Most likely so. Um, so what is interesting from the point of equality of opportunity that, that the results upset for two educational outcomes and the, the top income are actually in line with the principle of the fair equality of opportunity. Uh, however, 
if one agrees with the lack egalitarian equality of opportunity, it's basically that only the results for low income are in agreement with that. So the conclusions would be entirely opposite depending on which version of the equality of opportunity we agree with. So whether the welfare state does or doesn't, doesn't do anything for equality of opportunity. So as a final, the, the take home message for everybody here is that yes, an egalitarian welfare state can increase equality of opportunity, but rather that really depends on your preferred version of the equality of opportunity and the outcomes we are interested in how uh, and the ways how the welfare state can influence them. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yanni. I'm looking forward to the questions from our audience. So here, oh, no, this was just the note if you would like to ask your questions. So perhaps I can start with a with one first question. Uh, I'm curious if if you would have uh, now a conversation with the government of your country, with the Minister of Education, what would you recommend them take into account the current educational policies in Finland and the results of your research? Well, the clearest thing is that I would think about the mechanism, what, what is actually happening in the, in, for the dropouts, especially those who don't continue to the secondary education. I, I mean, I think this is clearly things, I think the, the evidence kind of suggests that there are the negative, uh, negative selection happening that all this has done nothing to, that the kids themselves don't have really much influence on. And I think that's that's a kind of a group that we should target any kind of intervention that we if we want to reduce social inequalities in the fair way, independent of what we think is good or right. I think that would be the opposite case. But then, of course, there's much more harder question: Should we, should society, try to do something in the top end of the distribution? I think that has that's much harder question, and then that's of course a much more political question because I don't think we, even as scientists, we don't have a too good answer to that. Uh, that question, especially. Okay. So if anyone raised the hands, I'll go for my second question. <laughs> it's such a luxury. Uh, I'm curious to know about uh, how do you see your research in compare, like what's possible to do beyond Finland, is there a chance to create any comparative studies based on the first exploration you have to be doing or is the data is too good in Finland and there's nothing comparable around? No, 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 this is actually fairly simple data, but I think there are actually data sets that you can replicate this. Of course, it's a bit easier with the register data, you can go to the smaller detail and perhaps a look better, the better ways of looking at the looking at the specific mechanisms, but, but at this level, for sure, I think this is something that uh, we do not really, I mean, we have this expectation about the, what society do, does and doesn't do. And of course we have too high expectations about that. And I think that's something that worthwhile we could do, it should be actually do it done in different country contexts and also comparatively look at the, what actually is, what happens in there. In the, what what is the other what the, how the society interferes in the lives in a sense? Okay, Michael Hammond from UNFPA has a question. Yes, thank you so much for this presentation. Indeed, I want to go back to one of the question the question that Daniela just asked before. So, if you were asked what's the most strategic intervention, and you said it would be to focus on getting primary school kids, if I understood you correctly. Mm -hmm into secondary school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us what, what holds it back? What are the issues here? Why are we not investing more in this area? Is it a question of financing? Is it a question of special programs? If this is the recommended action or you know, mm -hmm. the recommended objective rather, because that itself is not an action, what action would you recommend to make that happen? Mm. So well, what is actually happening in Finland now? I think it's uh, uh, what is interesting that, of course, that secondary education hasn't been compulsory this far, but now now the legislation is going to be changed. So basically, 
all the kids are expected to have a secondary education done by the uh, and until the age of 18 and then then we don't care that about the, after that and this is of course one of way of doing that we basically force everybody to stay in education but this is of course also very ineffective we know that already that 95 percent of the kids actually they go to the secondary education but they just never get the degree so there's something happening in between and and this is of course when we try to find why is that happening that's super costly and the, the, the answers are not, not necessarily always uh, the ones that we want to get. It's much easier politically to sell the kind of a universal solution, saying that, okay, this will benefit kids from all families, and the, rather than the, actually this, the, 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 the changes that would actually benefit the, the specific group of kids. And that this is, of course, something that I think it's part of the, part of the political, uh, part of the, how the political system works in a sense that the, that the, the specific groups are often those are that there are not that many interests for taking care of the needs of those groups and and especially when we are not able to pinpoint what what actually benefit what how, what kind of benefits would be followed from everybody for when we take care of those the, the specialty groups uh, especially but also it's part of that we don't really actually know that much what is happening there so this actually the research needed as well that that what is the what is the kind of a key mechanism that yeah, holds these kind of kids back? Thank you so much. Nico raised his hands. Yes, please. I would like to follow up on uh, this discussion, which is very interesting. And uh, the point that I like to raise is the gender dimension. So equal opportunities for boys may be not the same as the equal opportunities for girls. Could you uh, elaborate a bit more about the gender dimension of your, uh, your equal opportunities uh, story. Yeah, the, the, here of course we cannot say much based on these results because we identify that bit based on the based on the gender uh, gender uh, uh, the same and different sex sex uh, twins here, but of course that that's a big discussion as well whether the whether the the educational uh, ed, educational choices and educational uh, decision made on the in the, in the teenage are whether they are different for girls and boys or whether they are different learners. But I have to say also that at the same time that the, the literature on that regard is not that clear cut either. I mean, there's a, let's, it seems to be that there's a lots of discussion on the on how how different boys and girls are are in the in the end. But actually, I, I don't think we have a good conclusions here. I mean, we know for sure that the, the preferences and the educational choices made are very different. But whether that whether whether that is kind of a does the, in as much as it's really gender issue, it's I think it's still quite unclear. Okay, so if there's no more questions coming, I'll thank you, Yanni, very much for joining our event and for this excellent talk.